Hey, good evening everyone. Hey, can you all hear me? Uh, I just want to confirm. Thanks, Ashutosh. Hey, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, everyone, depending on your location. My name is Janaki Ram, and uh, I would be driving you through this. Uh, I'm the instructor here. So uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, let's get started. Um, and for the sake of reference, I would be recording this uh, session as well. 
This conference will now be recorded. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see it, and then we can get started. Yes, we can see that. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, the topic for today is uh, project management principles, right? So that would be the primary focus of discussion. And as you know, uh, project management is a vast subject, right? So we'll try to focus more on the principles. But uh, before that, we'd, we'd get to know and cover the details at a high level, you know, what, what is project management and what is built around it, right? And how does... Uh, today's project management principles, how did they evolve and where did they evolve from? So, uh, quick intro about Tech Canvas, right? So, we are an IT certifications organization, right? We are there since 2011. We are PMI authorized training provider. We are IABA endorsed education provider. Right? So, uh, from PM, PMI point of view, we right now uh, prepare professionals for their project management professional certification, as well as uh, certified associate project management certification. That is your CAPM and PMP. So myself, I am Janaki Ram, and I am a PMI authorized PMP trainer from Tech Canvas. So I have 15 plus years of experience, primarily in the software industry, out of which a bulk of 13 plus years is into project management. And uh, I am a PMP certified from PMI in the year 2014. And I'm also certified Scrum Master from Scrum Alliance. And during my good old programming days, I used to be a Microsoft certified solution developer. Now, who is this webinar for, right? So let us have a quick look. For those who have a career trajectory towards a project manager role, or you may be aiming for a project manager role in the near future, or you are already in that path, right? This is very relevant for you. And those who have newly settled in a PM role, they are trying to explore the role, and they are looking at various options that they can do. And for those who are already in a PM role, but you are looking for some kind of a refresher as to what's going on, right? Like someone like me, I've been uh, in project management since 2000, uh, since 2008 or so, right? So uh, for me, I would like to know what's happening, right? What are the new uh, emerging trends in project management? So how, how, how has it evolved as of today? So someone like that, you would find this useful. So what is the agenda for today? Uh, we'll try to understand what are projects, programs, and portfolios at a high level. And we'll try and understand what are the leading methodologies today. Uh, we'll not go too deep into the methodologies, but at a high level, we'll touch the surface. Then we'll talk about classic process groups, you know, how we used to handle project management as a set of sequential processes. right? And then we'll talk about the core concept that we are uh, trying to discuss today, the project management principles. And then uh, we will touch base upon popular project management tools, and we will close the session for today. Right. So before we start, uh, in quite an unorthodox manner, uh, I would like to understand from you, what do you think is the most sought after certification in project management domain today? Okay. You can either put your choice in the chat box or tell me on the call. I'm fine with either of those options. What do you think? Yes, I got one answer, PMP. OK. Uh, I want the session to be interactive, so feel free to ask any questions. Uh, since we are talking about project management, it's a broad uh, subject. The, the questions can be anything. Uh, don't mind it being silly. I'm fine to answer them. Prince, too, we have one more answer. Right. I, I'd go ahead and crack the answer, right? So the answer is PMP. Uh, that doesn't mean Prince 2 is any, anything less or not, right? So they are also in equally in demand. So what is it that is being most sought after? Uh, as of today, it's PMP. And let's see the reason why, okay? So there was a salary survey that was conducted by PMI, right? PMI is a nonprofit institute. Uh, 
that provides the credentials for PMP certification. Okay, so that salary survey revealed that uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a salary difference between certified project managers and non-certified. And primarily in North America, we have a 25% difference in the salary. Okay, and you can see the numbers are higher in the other geographies. Like Poland has 32%, South Africa has 58%, and India has 38%. So that is one of the primary reasons. So I was since we specialize in PMP from Tech Canvas, I was trying to gauge your understanding. Okay, so 25% is the difference in North America. And as we speak today, there are roughly around a million PMP certification holders all over the world, right? The number seems large, right? You think that there are a million project managers, certified project managers uh, on PMP, uh, you may get the image that there are too many project managers out there. But the forecast is something different, right? Research indicates that employers will need to fill 2.2 million new project-oriented roles each year till 2027. This means that project managers are going to be in high demand and that 1 million certification holders may look tiny to you now. Okay. So throughout this course, uh, I would be referring to PIMBOK once in a while. Okay, so for those who are not familiar with PIMBOK, uh, let me give a quick introduction. So this happens to be a major reference guide for the PMP certification exam. Okay, and uh, this is the latest, this happens to be seventh edition. And this guide contains all the best practices and standards in project management across the industries. And they have been consolidated into a single reference guide. And this is one of the major reference guide for the PMP exam. So I will be touch basing some concepts here and there from this guide. Right. So the seventh edition, just for your information, has some radical changes. And uh, I will discuss why that is so, uh, because the project management thought process has itself changed drastically the past 10 years. Right. So we'll discuss that why. And yeah, so that one of the radical changes is that uh, we are shifting from a process-based approach towards project management towards a principles-based approach. And that's why we are having this session as what are the principles in project management? And one more radical change is that uh, the focus is on value delivery system. So one of the principles we'll talk today is about value. So what is value and how do we measure that and why is it important in project management? Okay, so let's understand what is a project. Okay, I'm taking PIMBO guide as a reference, but uh, pretty much almost all the frameworks have a common point here, right? The project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. So how does this definition translate practically for us, right? So let us see some characteristics of a product. Project. The project is temporary, right? That's the first, uh, the second letter mentioned in the definition. So when, it's, when you say temporary, it means that a project has a start date and an end date. So if you are if you are working on something and if you don't have uh, an end date for it, it definitely does not fit under a project as definition. Okay, if it is repetitive, if it is day-to-day -day activity that you're repeating and uh, it doesn't have an end date, that typically falls under operations. The project has a start date and end date. So it is called temporary. A, a project is unique. And that is for a reason. I'll explain why. Because it has a goal or objective. So every project has a goal or objective. It need not be economic or financial. There can be other reasons as well. We'll discuss that when we're talking about value. But what makes a project unique is it has its own goal or objective. And finally, projects run because they are aligned with org strategy. That is typically with a medium-sized organization to a large-sized organization you have your projects aligned with the organization strategy. These are the characteristics of a project. Now, uh, let us see some examples, right? Uh, construction of a house is a project because you definitely have a start date and end date. The launching of a satellite, right? These are unique temporary undertakings. Once you launch a satellite, your project is done. Uh, launching of a mobile application, right? So this is going to say that a project can result in a product as well. 
construction of a dam. So these are typical examples of a project. Now, one step back. So what? So what is a program, right? So if you go to medium to large size companies, projects are grouped together if they are related, and then they are managed as a program. So let us look at the definition. We'll look at the examples after that, right? So related projects, subsidiary programs, and program activities that are managed in a coordinated manner to obtain benefits not available from managing them individually. So if I had to put it simply for you, a group of related projects that have a common goal together are managed as a program. Right? Let us look at the characteristics of a program. The projects underneath are related. That's how they are called as a program. Right? Projects share mutual goals. The reason they are related is because together they are trying to achieve a shared goal or a mutual goal. So this is a program for you. Now, uh, the first example in a project that we used was that of a construction of a house, right? Let's carry forward that analogy and look at an example for a program. Let's say I want to build a multiplex, right? Uh, it's a large project for me. So I can group together individual sub-projects, right? So a multiplex can contain a cinema hall. It can contain, it can contain a restaurant. It can also contain a shopping mall. So if I have to manage this program, I may give it to individual project managers because they are projects by themselves. And I can manage this as a program, as a multiplex program. Right? So in hierarchy, projects come below and programs are above projects. Uh, portfolio, right? So that's next in hierarchy. So we talked about projects, we talked about programs. Next in hierarchy comes portfolio. Right? So what does PIMBOK define it as? Right? Projects, programs, subsidiary portfolios, and operations managed as a group to achieve strategic objectives. Okay. So uh, what are the characteristics of a portfolio? It has projects and programs, but need not be related. Now I'll explain that with the example. Together, they achieve strategic objectives. They are together, right? So projects and programs are together because uh, the organization has a strategy or strategic objective or strategic goal which they are trying to fulfill they are typically aligned to a business domain okay now let's try to make sense out of this by looking at an example uh, we talked about construction of a house as a project then we move to multiplex as a program now what if the company decides to spread their uh, arms and uh, deal with other areas of business right so what if they also or constructing uh, or also de dealing with other programs like luxury villas or a farmhouse, for example, right? But together, they form a domain, right? They are uh, something like a prime real estate portfolio. They are not related with each other if you look at them, right? But for you, uh, as a part of your senior management, it makes sense for you to uh, group them together and manage them as a portfolio. So if I have to build another portfolio for this company, uh, they are into real estate, right? So it can be uh, agricultural real estate, for example. Right? So you can divide portfolio based on that. So we had a look at what is a project, what is a program, what is a portfolio. From here on, we'll, we'll put our focus on project methodologies, uh, process, and principles. Right? So feel free to ask questions in the chat box. I can pass the session and answer your questions if anything is uh, not clear. We'll start with classic project management process groups. Right? So uh, at least 20 years earlier, and more than that, project management used to happen through processes. Right? You had a sequential steps of processes, and then you used to group those processes together, and then you used to run your project. So one of the classic examples of process groups is the PMI's uh, process group. So let us look at them. A project typically starts with initiation. Right? This is the part where a project manager uh, typically has uh, starts working on a project charter. Right? This is the part where uh, the project manager also starts engaging stakeholders. Right? So 
you have a high level requirements defined here you have high level risks you have high level assumptions you have uh, a budget allocated and you have rough timelines defined this is your typical initiation process group and then underneath after that you start by planning for the project right so your planning may include various attributes in a project right you can uh, plan for scope right you can plan for quality you can plan for schedule right you can plan for budget so this is the area where you uh, plan now if you look at it this is sequential i initiated the project i have defined the project charter then i started planning for the project like scope quality and budget right now so sequentially next in lines comes executing right that makes logical sense you have planned for a project it's time for you to start executing your project now execution is straightforward your job as a project manager is to make sure whatever you have planned for okay what are your plan for you are trying to deliver right if a plan for let's say in scope you have planned for 100 requirements uh, you are you will try to deliver those 100 requirements as a part of execution now execution goes hand in hand with something called monitoring and control right so why do we need this uh, it is pretty straightforward you are executing a project as per your plan but you need to monitor whether you are on track with your plan right if you have planned for 100 requirements as i say uh, you need to check time and again whether you are on track in completing the 100 requirements within the committed timeline now that's how you use monitor and control so that is just one example you can monitor and control your quality you can monitor and control your budget you can monitor and control your risks so uh, all the set of processes with which you monitor what you are executing come under monitor and control so with this you should be in better control of the project you should be able to start delivering the requirements that you committed for and that's how you finally close your project right like i said a project is temporary you have a start date and end date right and that's why you are finally closing your project so this is your classic pm process groups right if you look at it this is sequential except for monitoring and control uh, which goes hand in hand with executing uh, planning and a bit of initiation this is pretty much sequential and this is classic way of dealing with project management now where are we today right uh, so your process based sequential project management gave birth to something called waterfall model of project management so some of you may be aware of it some of you may not be for new project managers who haven't worked on waterfall method before this will be something new right so i'll just touch the surface i'll not go into details so it is nothing but uh, a sequential way of uh, managing a project right if i look at a typical uh, software application as an example so if i have to run it in waterfall model i would typically start with analyzing analyzing the project right i will look at requirements uh, i'll try to freeze the requirements with the uh, project sponsors and other stakeholders and then sequentially i'll start designing for the project right so once i freeze the requirements typically design for the project before i start coding now once i'm done with design when i freeze my design i start developing the code right and then here i can't start the next phase or next process before i complete the previous process and after i develop i send it for testing and after i am done with testing i deliver so this is all sequential and it has its own pros and cons so we'll discuss that in a particular slide as to what is the pros uh, what is the difference clearly between uh, going sequentially and not going sequentially okay so next is uh, i am only picking popular methodologies today uh, so completely contrary to the waterfall model is your agile model right so what you try to do is if you look at the previous model the customer has to wait all the way from analysis to deliver for him to realize some value out of the project right if each of this phase takes one month we are talking about at least 5 months for the 
customer to realize uh, what he has expected. So for that to be compensated, right? That's where uh, we have a contrary uh, methodology called agile, right? So you try to uh, deliver incrementally in iterations, and you will fit in all your uh, processes into single iterations. So I am taking the example of Scrum methodology here, which is an agile framework. You have something called iterations or sprints, and instead of delivering everything at a single go. you will take pieces of the requirement and you start delivering them uh, time box by time box so each of the sprint can be uh, two weeks to one month long that's a recommendation uh, so which means that customer can start seeing value out of his proposal right from two weeks of requirement gathering so this is at a very high level uh, 10000 foot birds eye view of difference between waterfall and agile so why are we discuss this today right we are supposed to discuss principles is to understand how project management has evolved from a sequential way of dealing things to iterative way of delivering iterative way of delivering value okay so this is how project management has evolved today right and we, it is going to evolve further but as of now this is where we stand so what are the key differences right we we saw how it works what are the key differences right the focus uh, is totally different in project management uh, in waterfall we focus more on plans and artifacts because we we take specific time for planning for the project we need to make sure that we follow the plan the focus is completely shifted towards the plan whereas in agile you have seen that we start delivering early since we start delivering early the focus is more on value what we are delivering so what is value how does it help project managers and stakeholders we'll look at it in a principle in upcoming slide but for now you can think that value is the benefit uh, that you derive out of project it can be financial or non financial but the, the the benefit that you derive out of the project so how do you handle changes right in waterfall it's very reactive if you have frozen your requirements and you are executing your project uh changes are very minimally encouraged right changes are very minimally encouraged and every change has to undergo a huge process of approval and analysis whereas agile welcomes change in fact one of the principles foundation founding principles of agile says respond to change over following over following a plan that's in fact a core value of agile one of the four values of agile so which means agile is change friendly whereas uh, waterfall is change averse and planning in waterfall is upfront you take complete time uh, a time box for you to plan and then you freeze the plan you baseline the plan and you try to proceed executing the plan and as i mentioned earlier any changes to the plan are uh, minimally encouraged whereas in agile you do something called rolling wave planning right so if you look at the previous diagram uh, that i talked about iteratively uh, delivering value you have a planning activity as a part of every iteration or sprint so you repetitively plan you progressively elaborate and you deliver iteratively the authority okay this is very important from yeah, because we're all project managers here right or uh, aiming to be project managers in waterfall a project manager's authority is more command and control so he is in the top of the hierarchy and he takes control of most of the activities in the project and typically he does micro management depending on the size of the team but whereas in agile the teams are something called self organized okay so they organize their work they take decisions they estimate their work and they are in control of the project so the control has shifted from top level project manager to teams and the control and the authority is distributed among them so that is how you call teams self organized in agile in delivery if you have seen the previous slide uh, waterfall is sequential and agile is iterative or incremental and in pro in waterfall we have typical tilt towards contract as a project manager right you sign contracts and then you try to uh, meet the contract obligations right but whereas in agile 
your focus is more towards customer and what is the value that is trying to expect out of the project and in waterfall a project manager is a typically the planner at least he facilitates the planning whereas in agile he is more of a process facilitator right so the decision is taken as a team together and that's the reason they are called as self organized teams and finally the teams in waterfall run on silos right so you have a lot of individual contributors in waterfall they are compartmentalized so a large piece of requirement gets broken into lower level of requirements and then individuals work on those requirements and their perspective and their field of vision will only be limited to that activity that came to them as a task right whereas in agile the visibility is more there is a lot of transparency in fact every team member has visibility into the work of the rest of the team members and that's how they are called uh, self organizing so that ends up the team having shared goals okay so this is at a high level a uh, quick look at the methodologies but why do we did this, discuss all this right uh, because we, before we go there i would like to uh, understand from you what do you think is the most important aspect in a project that a project manager must focus on it can be anything uh, that comes to your mind feel free to put it in the chat box communication good value good answer anyone else before i proceed you can think of a lot right you might have worked on projects and you might have seen a lot of aspects so, so i am going to uh, consolidate all those aspects and try to put it under seven different uh, categories right so nisli says aware of project fails correct right then put it under risk but uh, that's a good answer so these are the three domains that uh, pmp uh, uh, exam considers right and this makes sense right so we have people we have process we have business right as a project manager your focus will be on these three items now uh, let me consolidate what all the aspects can be and try to put under this okay uh, leadership is important right uh, under people you also have stakeholder right you not only manage your teams you also communicate and collaborate with team members outside right uh, yogita says servant leader that's a very good answer it's very relevant to today's project management scenarios thank you right so under people i am putting leadership and stakeholder management right so process what does it contain right delivery right somebody talked about value here so what are you delivering you're delivering value so it comes under that uh you manage risks right so what what are the things that can uh hamper your project process uh, or stop your project altogether right you need to manage risks as well what else do you manage you manage quality obviously and you do manage change right uh whether it be a waterfall methodology or agile you will be subject to change right only the frequency may change here and there and finally business i'm going to put a single abstract item called big picture it can involve anything from uh, anything from your enterprise factors or your organizational assets or uh, anything from outside the project in your organization that can influence your project right i am just going to put it simple in a single uh, aspect called big picture now what we are going to do here is understand what is the principle okay and then try to uh, look at popular principles and map them underneath this right how you can be a principle driven project manager and run your project so how has project management evolved like right? i have shown you that we have moved from process based project manager to today it's more or less principle based okay and why has this come why do we need principles let us let us understand what is a principle right uh, the definition of principle is that it is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning right so uh, let's make this simple right let's take the three words 
after the quotes a fundamental truth or proposition right so you need to identify what is the underlying truth that you are trying to achieve and use that as your guiding force now let us look at some examples before we get confused right why do we need principles right we had processes they were working well so why do we need principles we need we need a principles because the market has dynamically changed for the past 20 years if you look at history 20 years back there was this internet boom right uh, i'm not sure how many of you were born at that time but we had this internet boom where uh, slowly businesses started moving to internet which means there was a uh, burst of competition in the market right and then another significant milestone was that we had the cloud boom in the past uh, 10 years or so we had a gradual high steep uh, movement of businesses towards a cloud model now why did this shift us towards principles is because processes are rigid you cannot rely on a process and try to tailor it across different projects right it's going to be painful what we can do rather is define principles right what you want to achieve how would you like to do your work right define principles and put processes on top of principles so tomorrow if you want to change a process because it is not fitting your work it becomes easy because the underlying principle never changes you are only going to change the process on top of it that is going to fit your work so that is the reason you see that there is a shift from process based project management to principle based now don't get me wrong uh, there are still a lot of projects that are still relevant to go with process based approach right um so this is still relevant to this market but uh, as a project manager we should be balancing between both depending on the complexity of the project now if you look at this uh, this situation here uh they are trying to put the same process across for uh, different projects if you look at it that way and that doesn't fit right let's take some general examples of what is a principle like right? Mr Mark is a man of principle and good to his word and that is his principle he sticks to his word so whatever he does on top of that principle he makes sure that he doesn't deviate from his principle he'll always stick to his word all internal combustion engines work on the same principles so this is a scientific example uh, your gravitational theory is run on a fundamental truth based on principles of gravity right so so it's a an underlying fundamental truth countries must have certain fundamental principles of human rights that's another example it's, these are general examples two principles of happiness are being kind and smiling a lot they have a business principle in which is to put the customers interest first okay this matches close to what we can do right so uh, let us look at some examples from a project perspective right if you are part of a project not as a project manager but as part of project you know, what are some principles that can help you right never start your work before your proposal is acknowledged that can be a principle right you commit something uh, to the customer but the customer has not acknowledged you start working on that the customer says change in plan your effort goes in waste so you can have this as a principle always take feedback after you deliver your work right this this can be another principle do not work more than two tasks at a time right so we have a limit to parallelization so we can limit ourselves with a principle always keep your list of work prioritized and communicate objectively when you report work status these are some examples of you know um, principles which can help you deliver your project now now we'll come to the core of the subject right project management principles so there are there are dozens of popular project management principles right uh, we have our agile manifesto itself right there are 12 principles underneath it uh, we have our prince two principles we have seven principles uh, we have lean principles there are seven again and then uh, with the recent addition of pimbok from pmi we have 12 principles seems like 12 and 7 are the magic numbers but uh, these are some popular principles now what we'll do from here uh, we'll pick up the last one and we will uh, try to go through those principles and then look at examples 
tools and artifacts that can come out of these principles that can help you as project manager. Okay. The first principle says, be a diligent, respectful, and a caring steward. Okay. This falls under leadership aspect of project management. Now, uh, what is steward? Who is a steward and stewardship, right? So uh, one aspect, there are many meanings of steward, but I'll explain what is the context here. Stewardship focuses on promoting well-being for each person within an organization. One of the many ways to promote this well-being is to ensure that each individual is generally happy in his or her working environment. Now, how is this relevant to you as a project manager? This is relevant uh, in the sense that you are not only managing and running your project, you need to make sure that the team members are comfortable. That's where a steward comes into picture. Now, how do you make your team members comfortable? These are the keywords, right? Before I explain these keywords, you know who a steward is, right? Now, there are many, there are many uh, meanings for the word steward, but one of them happens to be a flight attendant, right? So what does a flight attendant do when you go in a flight? Right. You you technically you do not need a flight attendant. Right? You have the pilot, you have the flight, you have the tickets. Uh, you can go to a destination by just sitting on your seat. Right. The reason we have stewards in flights is uh, they make you feel comfortable. You are flying fifty thousand feet in the air, and must be someone who makes you feel home, uh, make you feel safe, and make you feel comfortable. Someone who you can trust. Right? Now, as a project manager, you need to play a similar role when you are driving projects. Right, projects can be chaotic. Right, there are ups and downs. It can be a roller coaster ride. Uh, there must be someone who plays the role of a steward when driving a project, and you, as a project manager, can play that role. Right? So the keywords here: right, integrity and core of ethics. Uh, the first and last one are uh, straightforward. Right, what really matters here is care and trustworthiness. These words, right? Uh, the team should understand that you care. And there should be zero trust deficit. So that is what this principle drives. Right. So the second principle is all about creating a collaborative team environment for the project. This also comes under leadership. Now, how do you do that? Let us understand what is a collaboration, right? Collaboration is a communication and project management approach that emphasizes teamwork, innovative thinking, and equal participation to achieve objectives. But why do we need to do all this, right? Why, why do you need to set up collaboration in the team as a project manager? Primarily, to complete project efficiently, right? Better collaboration between the team members means lesser headaches for the project manager and the project runs smoothly. And collaboration better be part of a corporate culture in case you as a project manager land up in an organization or a project that doesn't have collaboration uh, as a culture, you can be the starting point. Right? And then technology comes into picture. Uh, the general idea is to identify what's needed for collaboration and then decide the technology. Now, let us look at some tools and artifacts for collaboration. Right? Uh, one thing is something called the team charter. Okay, team charter is a document where you list down all the team's preferences, right? The team may have their own preferences like the meeting times, uh, the communication method they would like to do, uh, uh, conflict resolution techniques. So all this can be decided with the team, talk to the team, uh, understand what are their preferences, come to an agreement with the entire team and document it that, so that the team is very comfortable. Once you understand that, uh, you can decide on next set of tools that you need, right? Your document repository can be a good collaboration tool. Uh, if your team has a good amount of documentation, you need to version them. You need to be able to share them. You should be able to uh, put security on top of it. So you need a good document repository as a collaboration tool. Right? Uh, you are, uh, yeah, Mabuto, you are going to have this video uploaded uh, for your reference. So. You can come back to, to our YouTube channel of Tech Canvas and uh, have a look at the video. Your instant messaging can be a collaboration tool as well. 
Right? This is very popular these days. And brainstorming is a tool that you can use to collaborate and implicitly or explicitly, consciously or subconsciously, many of us use it, right? Uh, we do not know it as a collaboration tool, but we end up using it. And this is very popular. The brainstorming is nothing but a meeting. It can be virtual or physical, where uh, you do not have a solution to a problem, but uh, you have the problem statement and you let the team uh, discuss this intensely until you come to a possible set of solutions. It's just, thing but, it's just nothing but meeting in plain terms. These are possible sets of uh, tools and artifacts. Now, uh, one thing for you to remember as a guideline, right? Do not decide the collaboration technology until you know what the team wants. And that you can derive from the team charter. So once you document what the team wants, it would be ideal for you to start deciding the collaboration technology. So the third principle is effectively engage with stakeholders. Now, let us understand who is a stakeholder, right? A stakeholder is anyone who can affect or can be affected by your project, right? I'm putting it very simply. It can be an individual, an organization, or a department, right? General misconception out there that many project managers think that stakeholders are customers or senior management. Anyone who gets impacted by the team is a stakeholder. Your own team members are your stakeholders, all right? You yourself are a stakeholder in the project because you are getting affected by the project as well. So the principle says that you need to effectively engage stakeholders, right? What do you, what do you need to do? The first step is to identify stakeholders, internal within the team or an external of the team, right? And you typically do it in the initiation stage of the project. The earlier you identify stakeholders, the more uh, less risky your project would be. Secondly, you will engage the stakeholders. You need to engage stakeholders. You need to understand what are their expectations in the project so that you can document them early and include them in your requirements. You need to analyze their influence as well. So there may be many stakeholders, but who do you prioritize? If your project has 100 stakeholders, are you going to have meetings with all the 100 stakeholders? It doesn't make sense, right? You need to understand what is the power and influence of every stakeholder? Okay. And you need to do this because you can prioritize which stakeholder you need to pay attention to most. Right. Uh, a stakeholder can have uh, great power and great influence. Right. So he, he should be on top of your priority list. A stakeholder can have zero power or zero influence. He's, get, he's just getting. Uh, interested in the project, then he, he may not be in the top of your priority, but you can keep him informed in your communication as to what's going on in your project. Right? So you need to analyze their influence. And finally, you need to collaborate with them as the project executes. Right? You may be uh, working on the project, you may be delivering incrementally, you need to involve stakeholders and communicate them the status of the project. So what are some tools and artifacts that can help you, right? So stakeholder register is one artifact where you typically list down all your stakeholders, okay? And you also put in your stakeholders' power and influence here, okay? So that you have it for reference and you are it is easy for you to refer back later. And I used to maintain stakeholder register personally in a Microsoft Excel sheet. Now you can build a power versus interest grid. Okay, this is nothing but a quadrant. Okay, uh, it is something like this. Your y-axis is your power, and your x-axis is your influence. And I can start listing the names of the uh, stakeholders uh, in various quadrants depending on where they are. Right, the top right quadrant is highly critical. They have high power and high influence. So this this quadrant for you is probably the most important quadrant. Okay, you can you can use this visual tool to analyze your stakeholders. Your communication plan is important in engaging stakeholders, right? How do you uh, collaborate or engage with them? So you can define a communication plan with them. Uh, certain stakeholders, you may want to communicate with them on a weekly basis. Certain stakeholders, you may want to communicate with them on a 
monthly basis right depending on the power and interest on the priority and that will in turn turn into your stakeholder stakeholder engagement plan so uh, this is typically an excel sheet uh, this is uh, a graph in excel sheet typically these both are uh, mostly word documents not necessarily in this format but this is how it worked for me the next principle is focus on value probably this is the most important uh, ideally it should come as a first principle but again nevertheless it is very important now i have this come, comes under the aspect of delivery because you deliver value now why is it so important right what is value worth or usefulness or importance of deliverable right uh, if we have to put it simply the outcome of the benefit from a deliverable now a value can be financial it can be an opportunity of business it need not be financial you may get through one project you may get another project as a opportunity right that that can also be looked at as a value customer impact right it can be also social benefit so all your non profit companies uh deliver value out of social benefit for example right so what are the tools and artifacts your business case can define value okay and your business value is a, a kind of a, a metric that you can use to track what is the value that's being delivered at a high level and at a lower level you can track story points typically used in agile as how much value was delivered okay so business value and story points are abstract numbers they are relative estimations right a project i can say uh, is trying to deliver 1000 uh, points of value right and some companies map this 1000 points of value with the economic number or financial number right i can say that this project is going to get us a benefit of 5 million dollars right now i can map this 5 million dollars to 1000 points and then i can track how this 1000 points are being achieved in the project so that's one way of tracking it right so this business value may get translated into story points later and at a low level you as a project manager will be tracking story points as a value the customer will be in, interested in uh, extracting early value out of the project right so value is more relevant in agile methodology just for your information the next principle is system interactions right recognize evaluate and respond to system interactions this is probably one of the most overlooked aspects as a project manager and project team members as well right you need to understand your project as a system okay so as i mentioned earlier in waterfall we typically looked at a project individual team members working in silos working as uh, individual contributors on individual activities now if you understand project as a system as a holistically uh you will understand the big picture right project teams must realize the holistic view of the project as a system a project may behave like a sub system or as a part of a larger system now uh, how can you do that right you can understand business areas you can put focus on big picture you can challenge assumptions you can seek external review so these are various ways how you can uh understand the interactions of a system but what are the tools and artifacts right so one tool you can use is systems thinking right system thinking is a top down approach where the team focuses on uh, the project as a system and then any changes you make to the system they understand the impact to sub components or sub system it is one approach towards project the second approach is design thinking right design thinking is mostly used for innovative ideas it's a bottom up approach where all the team members collaborate and identify areas of improvement or efficiency within the project and they do a bottom up scanning of the project a cross training can be one way of uh, making the team understand the project as a system because different team members work on different components right now if one one team member working on one component gives a cross training to the team on uh, who are working on other components they get to understand the system as a, the project as a big picture that that can be one tool that you can use right and as a project manager you can set up shared understanding in the project okay you can set up shared goals so that uh, 
uh, team understands the project uh, as a um, common goal for all of us and they look at the big picture of the project rather than their individual piece of work the next principle is about leadership behaviors right uh, this is this is a super set of the stewardship that we talked about and uh, this is important so effective leadership ensures positive outcome of the project and one important thing here is leadership is not limited to only project manager so you have certain attributes as a uh, leadership leader and how you exhibit that also influences the project positively right uh, some attributes are adapt to situation okay uh, exhibit integrity and ethics right not only a project manager uh, needs to exhibit right even every team member can exhibit it and you can train the team members on these aspects directive action during chaos this is a good example of a leader right when the team is in chaos a good decision maker is what they will be looking for right so a leader should be able to take directive action during a chaotic situation and always have an eye on the vision remember your project starts with a vision right and from the vision comes your project charter and then there from there comes your plans right project plans and then you execute your project so everything has derived from project vision a leader always has his eyes on the vision he never deviates from the vision so that's why you hear terms like visionary leader right because they have uh, a vision of what we are trying to achieve as a project so what are tools and certificates that can help you here right servant leadership you might have heard this term right uh, i'll put it very simply for you a typical leader right a traditional leader uh, the team used to work for the leader right if you remember the classic way of that the team used to work for the leader the, the leader used to command and control and execute the project in servant leadership the leader works for the team okay what does this mean right first step is a servant leader removes any impediments or blockers for the team so that they are able to run the project successfully okay the second second aspect of it is a servant leader uh, helps the team in smoothly running the project by understanding what the project needs what the team members need okay it need not be an impediment or blocker right if the team wants something that can improve the efficiency of the project he is there to help them uh, get what they need so there is a shift in mindset a servant leader works for the team uh, stewardship we have already discussed you need to make sure that the team is comfortable and the team charter uh, the document that i mentioned earlier can be of help to you as an artifact here and there are various leadership styles right uh, right from right from uh, a uh, micromanager to all the way to a manager who gives free hand to the team right so sometimes there is a discussion whether one should be a leader or one should be a manager right and typically many people say that uh, leadership scores for manager right but uh, in reality uh, you as a project manager needs to balance between being a leader and a manager depending on the situation the next principle is tailor based on context right you need to customize your project based on the context in the organization right your tailoring is selecting relevant process policy or standard for the project based on the context of the project or organization to put it simply how how flexible are you to customize the process for your project right every project is unique and that's the reason you need to customize and you can customize the methodology itself based on the project needs you can customize the standards procedures so all these are customizable so what are the tools and artifacts that can help you right your project management information system whichever is in the organization you will use that to customize your process and then your agile tracking tools for your agile projects this is a simple principle next principle probably the most important is build quality into process and deliverables now what is quality right it's meeting the intended purpose of the project if i have to put it simply right it may also include fit for use right you may meet the intended purpose of the project but what if your uh, product crashes quite often 
okay it, it's not usable so that is also part of quality right you can uh, uh, quality can be determined by how much you confirm to requirements uh, how much reliable is your product uh, how good is the performance how resilient uh, how resilient is your project on top of that so there is a question uh, let me quickly answer that before i proceed first so uh, yogita asks that tailoring is mentioned in pinbox 7 will it be there if i am planning to give the exam in november 21 so there is no official confirmation from pmi on when the pinbox 7 will be re relevant as a guide okay for the pmp exam november 21 looks uh, too aggressive i don't think you would need pinbox 7 for november 21 uh, in the historically pmi has given 6 months notice for us to uh, cope with the exam with the new edition so you have time for that you do not worry about it you can still refer to pinbox 6 edition so what are the tools and artifacts that can help you with quality right so uh, your quality metrics help you understand how good you are with the quality so that is obvious right it can be a report it can be a dashboard how would how are you do it the quality assurance and quality control i'm going to talk both of them in parallel right quality assurance is tools and techniques that you use to assure the quality you have promised to the customer right quality control to ensure that the promise to the customer is taking place by measuring the quality so your metrics and control quality go hand in hand your quality management plan is a typically a document and then you use variance analysis variance analysis you compare uh, you compare expected versus actuals right whether it is matching or not matching if not why and you go into root cause and try to fix it so uh, your variance variance analysis is as simple as that the ninth principle is navigate complexity and this is more relevant in today's world right so we are running on high competition environment and we typically run into requirements that are complex so what is complex right there is no standard definition for complexity particularly with project management but we can derive it based on certain factors so it can be a uh, number of subsystems right if a project has a lot of subsystems uh, sub components for example the complexity obviously increases because they interact with each other and uh, uh, dependencies right so uh, the, if there are dependencies externally and internally within the project the complexity increases ambiguities right if this, there is ambiguities in the project in terms of requirement or design your complexity increases if there are uncertainties your complexity increases so it can be a combination of these factors or uh, any individual reason could be the reason out of it so there is one more question here from uh, lakshman he asks i need to know this project management course will helps in pharmaceutical industry sector would you please give me an explanation yes so your your pmp certification right uh, covers a vast area of industries okay it is across all industries it is not only for software uh, we have students from uh, construction we have a lot of students from pharma uh, we have students from manufacturing uh, software obviously so your certification and this course is relevant for all industries pharma is more relevant actually if you ask me okay so the complexity so what are the tools and artifacts how we can navigate complexity right you can use brainstorming as a tool with the team to uh, decomplex the complex items uh, your expert judgment right you bring in subject matter experts and then try to understand the complexity and try to solve it your prototyping for example so you are building a product uh, it's complex you do not understand where you start you can start by building prototypes and then see how it behaves and then uh, proceed from there and if you are trying to estimate a project with high complexity you can use a relative estimation technique something like story points or uh, business values right story points are typically what we use to handle complexity your 10th principle is handling risk responses okay a risk is an uncertain future event which if it occurs has an effect on the project either positively or negatively so the general misconception is that risks are negative but as a project manager if you track positive risks also 
uh, you can help your project grab opportunities. So you typically calculate the probability of the risk, impact of the risk. You calculate the risk appetite, risk threshold, and uh, these factors you use to uh, identify risks and handle them. So what are the tools and artifacts that you can use, right? So uh, you use qualitative analysis. So here you understand the probability and the impact of the risk. And then higher the probability and higher the impact, the risk becomes high priority and try to handle the risk. And quantitative analysis is you quantitatively analyze how much the impact of the risk is going to be. Typically, it is in terms of uh, monetary factor, right? If, if my uh, risk one has an impact of $100,000 and uh, risk two has an impact of uh, $80,000, so uh, I would first focus on risk one. Uh, to de-risk it and uh, quantitatively I will be going in a descending order. Okay. And then we have something called risk burn down. As and when you mitigate and uh, handle risks, uh, it will be a downward going slope where the risk uh, impact will shortly start going down. Right? Your, your job as a project manager is to have a downward slope for your risks, active risks. And you have a document called risk management plan where you document how do you handle risks if it comes or mitigate risks when it comes. And you use certain tools like decision tree. You decision tree, you use it for typically handling uh, or doing quantitative analysis of your risks. The penalty paid principle is adaptivity and resiliency. Uh, it comes under quality. So resiliency, by definition, is your ability to recover from any failure or setback. And this uh, resiliency can be applied not only to project management, right? It is also used in architecture, for example, right? If, if your system or application goes down, how resilient is it for it to come back? Yeah. So there is one comment here. Brainstorming as a tool on its own does not achieve, hence must be augmented by brain dumping and brain walking. I completely agree with it. So brainstorming uh, may not be solving your problems, particularly when you are trying to navigate complexity. You may want to use it in conjunction with other tools, right? But it is a good starting point. It worked for me in my, in my experience. Uh, if the team is ambiguous in taking decisions, they all have various points and factors to discuss and take decision, but they're not able to take decision, bringing them to a single room and brainstorming actually gives us a couple of options. It gives us a starting point where to navigate there from. But I agree with you, it, it standalone, it's not sufficient. So how do you make your project resilient, right? You can have short feedback loops, right? Instead of delivering your project for a good six to 10 months, uh, you can deliver them incrementally in short feedback loops so that you get earlier feedback and you make your project more resilient. Continuous improvement, right? Feedback loops and continuous imp improvement go hand in hand. Regular inspection, that frequent quality audits. Diverse team with broad skill sets, okay? That will reduce the risk a bit. And transparent planning, so that the team is able to see what is being planned. And if they see any risk beforehand, they can raise it upfront. So that will make your project more robust and uh, very resilient. Right? The final principle for today is uh, enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. Uh, remember I told you that uh, traditionally project managers were ours to change and I belong to that generation when I started my career. Right, And over a period of time uh, we have become more change friendly. Right. So changes are introduced in a project for it to stay relevant with the outside world. That's correct, right? You may have experienced, right, that uh, you have uh, baselined your scope, right? You have frozen your requirements. You start your project. Your customer comes back and says that I need this to be changed, this requirement to be changed. I need these additional requirements. Now, why does this all come from, right? This is because mar as and when market changes, the customer would like to stay relevant. This is one of the primary reasons. and. Uh, the modern principles in project management uh, propose project managers to be change friendly. So your change can be internal and external. Okay, uh, you would have to collaborate with stakeholders constantly to understand change upfront, and then you review and analyze the changes. And uh, most importantly, 
as a project manager if you see that your team comes from a traditional background and they are averse to changes you need to introduce a culture of change so that they are comfortable with changes coming in that's what are certain tools and artifacts right? uh you can have a change control board typically used for your traditional projects this change control board reviews all the incoming changes and then they accept or reject a change based on the impact and your if you are project is change driven if you see that your customer is constantly coming back with changes because the market is volatile you better change your methodology to adaptive methodology any of the agile frameworks right you can go with that because agile is change friendly and you you have an artifact called change management plan you can use it to uh, define change management process roles responsibilities authorities etc correct it's a very good question to what extent should change be allowed since it can lead to scope creeping is a very good question we have something called uh variance right or tolerance okay uh you as a project manager can uh set this tolerance levels beforehand okay uh, let's say your project was budgeted for uh 1 million us dollars okay now you can put in a tolerance level saying my project budget is 1 million us dollars now i can tolerate an additional 10000 or uh, additional 100000 dollars of additional effort coming my way now you can pro- plan your project project this way so if uh, if ever your stakeholders or customers are coming with changes you can prioritize these changes and see what can fit into this 100000 dollars okay now if it goes beyond that is what when you stop tolerating now you can escalate that further to a project sponsor or senior management and take decisions but this is how you can handle for your traditional projects okay but if your project is not traditional and you have a certain adaptive methodology like agile then there is no problem because you will be introducing changes sprint after sprint so this is a change driven methodology so in such cases where you have frequent changes coming in if it is going beyond the tolerance then you can look at options of implementing a methodology that is change driven and change friendly okay that's a good question so with this we are done with this 12 principles right we are running out of time but what i will close quickly is talk about two quick project management tools and then i will open for questions and we can close it right so one popular project management tool is microsoft project uh some of you may be familiar with it, you would have worked with it i worked with it a lot during the beginning of my career particularly with waterfall projects because uh, microsoft project is good with gantt charts right it help you draw your gantt diagrams so that you can track your committed schedule and milestones and it integrates with other microsoft office tools very easily it's not very user friendly and it can link to multiple project plans so this is we have an online version of it now Uh, microsoft has an online version so uh, you can access it through web in your organization in your internet network um, but earlier it used to be a heavy desktop version where you have to install it and uh, every project manager had his own copy of the project plan so this is typically used for project planning and tracking the project plan as per the execution the second popular tool i would like to discuss from agile perspective right the microsoft project was uh primarily used for waterfall method so jira is a tool that's widely used today for agile projects right and they have an online version of it where everybody can access in the team through internet right so it's popular for managing agile projects and uh, they also have uh, an additional plugins for uh, managing your information in the project right and then uh, you can customize the workflow remember we talked about tailoring as one of the principles so you can customize the workflow and it has many third party integrations if you have to uh, within your organization right like you can integrate with your source control like github you can integrate with your outlook etc so these are two popular project management tools now before i close i would like to understand from you what is your favorite project management tool right so mine is microsoft excel for simplicity so what do you, what is yours uh, in your experience 
I'm glad to know I have company. Prasad uses Excel as well. Anyone else has favorites? OK, that's uh, nice. So uh, we are done with today's webinar. Anybody has any questions on top of what you have asked so far? When it comes to PM methodology, why always people compare waterfall and agile only for every project? Now, yeah, I would like to clarify one thing. That's a good question. Uh, there is a misconception that uh, waterfall is traditional. It's out of date. So waterfall is not out of date. OK, it's just that competition has increased in the market. Waterfall may not fit all the projects. People are looking for alternatives. They found Agile. So though Agile uh, started way back in early 90s, it became popular after the internet burst and cloud burst. OK, so it's an alternative to Waterfall to certain set of projects. So Waterfall is very relevant. So one of the persons asked about pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical industry right? So. I have seen that a lot of pharmaceutical projects run on waterfall. It cannot move to agile. It's very relevant. Your construction projects run on waterfall. Your uh, uh, movie production uh, projects run on waterfall. So it's very relevant, right? So that is the reason uh, they compare these both because both are contrary. Because either you deliver value early or you deliver value at the end, depending on the nature of your project. So these two are an umbrella set of projects, uh, methodologies which you compare. So what is the percentage of change that is acceptable on a scale of 100 in Agile if the business is too dynamic? So Agile is an umbrella, right? So it is a, it's a set of values and principles. You try to develop frameworks on top of it, right? So your Scrum is one such framework of Agile, OK? And uh, one more example is Kanban, right? And we have Lean, we have DSDM, we have many others. We'll talk about Scrum and Kanban, right? So your question is valid. Let's say you're running a project. You are getting a predictive set of changes from the customer. The customer is comfortable giving you a set of changes every two weeks. OK? If he is giving you a feedback and changes every set of two weeks, you can define your iterations to be two weeks. Because you make two weeks of gap for you to implement the previous week's feedback. And you can keep on constantly delivering uh, changes every two weeks. Okay. So you have predictable, predictable set of changes coming to you every two weeks, for example. Now your customer has become more volatile. His market has become more volatile. He doesn't know which change is going to come which minute. right? So uh, a similar implementation of Agile is Kanban, where you do not know which change is coming, going, going to come your way at which minute. You will use a Kanban board or task board rather than time boxing. right? So in a task board, you have three options, uh, three stages of a task, right? You have to do, you have in progress, and you have completed. OK, so your focus would be identifying items that are coming on the leftmost side to do. And then look at the priority. Start moving items to, to the next stage to closure. Your focus would be moving items from left to right. Your focus is not to do with any timeline or any time boxing. Right? So depending on the nature of the changes coming your way, you can have either of this framework. So in your case, you are asking that frequent changes are being requested. You can use Kanban here. So next question is, uh, Thomas is asking, should we have experience as a project manager for appearing for PMP exam? Or having an experience as manager for 11 years is OK to appear for the exam? Yes, you need to have, uh, if we have a four four year uh, educational degree, okay. You need to have 36 months of project management experience, or three years, right? Three years of project management experience. So if you are having 11 years, you are more than qualified. If you are not having a four-year degree, you need to have 60 months of project management experience, or um, five years of project management experience. Uh, anybody else has any questions? OK, so we are uh, running out of time. Uh, feel free to drop in your questions at the uh, YouTube channel. Yes, when you say 36 months, what documents are required? 
so you you will be initially when you apply for the pmp exam you will be initially asked for your project description project start date and end date and your project uh, description title and all those details right so once you submit your application uh, randomly pmi select some of these applications for audit so if you have, if they have randomly selected your application for audit they will ask you to produce certain documents as evidence for your experience right so one of those documents are your educational uh, certificates okay xerox copy a photocopy the other set of evidence they ask for is your testimonial from your project manager or your manager that you have worked on so and so project between so and so time as you have claimed and you need to get his physical signature and you to you need to uh, uh, courier this uh, hard copy uh, evidences to pmi office and again this is random not for everyone okay uh good any more questions all right great the questions were great if you have more questions uh, this video will be uploaded in your uh, youtube channel for future reference uh, you can put your questions there we will respond back to you Thanks for your time have a nice weekend everyone thank you bye This conference is no longer being recorded